Hare Krishna. Thank you all for coming to the temple this evening. It's a very auspicious time of year as we heard the different announcements being made by uh, Mother Mukya. So hopefully we'll be able to carry out some of that auspiciousness with us as we discuss Bhagavad Gita this evening. We're going to be reading a verse from the fourth canto excuse me, fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, text number two. It's a familiar verse. We can chant it together. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Chapter 4, Transcendental Knowledge, text number 2. Evam parampara praptam. Evam parampara praptam. Imam Raja Shayo Vidu. Imam Raja Shayo Vidu. Sakala Neha Mata. Sakala Neha Mata. Translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada. This supreme science was thus received through the chain of the Cyprus succession, and the saintly kings understood it in that way. But in the course of time, the succession was broken, and therefore the science as it is appears to be lost. Purport. It is clearly stated that the Gita was especially meant for the saintly kings because they were to execute its purpose in ruling over the citizens. Certainly, Bhagavad Gita was never meant for demonic persons who, who would dissipate its value for no one's benefit and would devise all types of interpretations according to personal whims. As soon as the original purpose was scattered by the motives of the unscrupulous commentators, <clears throat> there arose the need to reestablish the deceptive succession. 5,000 years ago, it was detected by the Lord himself that the deceptive succession was broken. And therefore, he declared that the purpose of the Gita appeared to be lost. In the same way, 
At the present moment, there is also there are also many so many editions of the Gita, especially in English, but almost none of them are not. Uh, uh, but almost all of them are not all according to authorized Hasidic succession. There are innumerable interpretations rendered by different mundane scholars, but almost all of them do not accept the supreme personality of Godhead Krishna, although they make a good business on the words of Sri Krishna. This spirit is demonic because demons do not believe in God, but simply enjoy the property of the Supreme. Since there is a great need for an edition of the Gita in English, as it is received by the Parampara Disciplic Succession system, an attempt is made herewith, that means this right here, but Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, when an attempt is made herewith, it means with this Gita, Bhagavad Gita as it is. An attempt is made herewith to fulfill this great want. Bhagavad Gita, accepted as it is, is a great boon to humanity. But if it is accepted as a treatise of philosophical speculation, it is simply a waste of time. Srila Prabhupada ki Om Gyanat Imaranda Shyagyanam Jana Shalakaya Satchim Nilayam Yena Kasma Shri Gurave Nama Actually over the last um, few months when I've been asked to give the Sunday talk I focused on verses from the Bhagavad Gita that emphasize different names of Krishna I don't expect any of you to remember, but I remember. <laughs> Some of the names we did on Gudikesh, O Conqueror of Sleep, Gudikesh, and we did Dhananjaya, a winner of wealth, Dhananjaya. And today, there's another name of Krishna given in this verse. He's called Parantapa, O Arjuna, Subduer of the Enemies. So that's particularly significant for what we want to discuss this evening, O Subduer of the Enemies, because I had the experience when I was a brahmachari, we were selling Prabhupada's books to professors on college campuses all over the United States and Canada. Actually, it went on all over the world with different members of our BBT library party. And so we would go to all different departments, not just the religion department, not just the philosophy department, but we would go to every department, English, chemistry, <laughs> whatever it was, we'd go there and try to explain to them how Bhagavad Gita was relevant to them and relevant to their department so they would buy it. I think we probably got <clears throat> more personal sales of Bhagavad Gita than and especially when you talk about chemistry and physics departments and things. But uh, people were interested. But one question kept coming up, and that question is what I wanted to talk about this evening. One question that recurred time and time again. Uh, and um, this is out of respect. Uh, concerns out of respect would come up, not just frivolous or demonic, as Prabhupada explains here in the purport today, inquiries, but sincere inquiries. Um, they would say, Bhagavad Gita has no doubt contributed to the philosophical Field. And my response is, why not the battlefield? Where do you want it to be spoken? If not the battlefield, where? Actually, because it was spoken on the battlefield, it reveals two things about Krishna's nature, which I think couldn't or may not come out otherwise. 
Uh, that is that Krishna has a flair for doing things. He's not a dull person. He likes um, excitement. A flair, let's just leave it at that. We'll get into it more later. So that's, that's what Krishna's nature we can understand from answering this question, why is the Bhagavad Gita is spoken in the battlefield? And the other is that Krishna is willing to do anything for his devotees. He loves his devotees so much he's willing to do anything for them. So these two things become clear when we understand this question of why Bhagavad Gita was spoken on the battlefield. So why not? Where do you expect Krishna to speak Bhagavad Gita? Why not? Do you expect him to speak it to solitary sages? who live in ashrams far away from society by themselves. Actually, we have a, my godbrother, Gopi Pranadana, who translated Vyad Bhagavatam Rita and other books. He tells a funny story about why the battlefield may be a place that's more appropriate for speaking Bhagavad Gita than a sage's ashram. He, he creates a picture with his words where you see this solitary grass hut far from any civilization and inhabited by <coughs> one person only, a sage. And so the story of this sage is that every day at 12 noon, he comes out of his cabin, his, his kutir, and he looks over the forest where he sees no people. He sits down, he does achman, he chants his Gayatri solitary, silent Gayatri mantra. And then he gets up, offers his obeisances, and goes back into his hut. That's the kind of life that sages live. It's not very exciting. It's not very exciting, especially when you think about Krishna going all that way just to speak to the solitary sage, to speak the Bhagavad Gita. Something more exciting is required. And so therefore, Gopi Pranadana says that the Shastras, the scriptures, will focus on kings, mainly. We get, we get the history of different kings, not the details of sages, but different stories of kings. And this is an example of how to understand the difference, how it's more interesting in the lives of a king than it is a solitary sage chanting his Gayatri in his ashram, think of the same scene, but for all, all of a sudden, and this is told in Srimad Bhagavatam, all of a sudden, a king comes in, he looks thirsty and angry, and he comes in with his bow, and he picks up a dead snake, garlands the sage, and storms out of the ashram. It, it all of a sudden got more interesting, didn't it? I mean, you have a king. Well, well, who's this king? What's he doing here? And, and why is he putting this? Why does he look angry? And why is he putting the snake on on the sage and then leaving? You know, automatically, you know, we get a more interesting idea. Uh, Want to find find out more? Becomes a more of a, an action movie or something. <laughs> yeah. with the king involved. And so that's why we find kings' lives are more interesting, actually, um, more like our own in one sense, in that you know, the details um, and the solitary experience are, are not something that most of society would go for. And so uh, with the king, we get more parts of the story explained and it becomes more interesting. Now, of course, why should it be interesting? Why, why are we concerned about it being interesting? Well, Krishna has a purpose when he comes to the world and when he sends his devotees to the world. And we read about this in the purport here today where Prabhupada is saying that over the course of time, even the Lord's instructions, they appear to be lost in different ways. And 
general people are therefore bereft of spiritual knowledge. So therefore he sends his representatives and he charges them with the task of distributing this knowledge. Now, distributing the knowledge is a lot easier when it's something that people can relate to, that they can understand, something that they're going through in their own lives, something that they, they can, that appears more real to them than just philosophical speculation or solitary bhajan. So therefore, making it interesting is part of the presentation. Think about it. In a few days, we're going to sit down and we're going to chant 700 verses of Bhagavad Gita. But Mahabharata, of which Bhagavad Gita is a chapter, has 100,000 verses. And what do those 100,000 verses do as they appear before the Bhagavad Gita is spoken and after the Bhagavad Gita is spoken? They give all the rich details and interesting details. If you look in Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita, there's a section called Setting the Scene that the BBT editors have put in there. And they realize the importance of setting the Bhagavad Gita in context or how it becomes interesting and therefore relevant in the lives of people. And they tell the whole history of the Pandavas and the Kauravas fighting over the kingdom and the insulting of Draupadi and all these kind of interesting facts that lead up to Krishna speaking Bhagavad Gita. So they make it interesting. These 100,000 verses, the purpose is to give it some context so it's interesting, so that we become gripped by the story and want to know what happened at every step. What happened when Krishna and Arjuna drove out in the chariot in the middle of the field? What did they discuss? Why did he decide to fight? Why was he discouraged in the first place? All these things are interesting parts of the history that make the instruction of Bhagavad Gita very relevant to us. So if we're trying to learn something about Krishna from this, the first thing we can understand is like, Krishna is, not, Krishna is meant to be relevant to our lives. Not that philosophical or religious or spiritual teachings are meant to be so esoteric that there's no practical use for them in their instructions in our lives. Well, Krishna goes to a great degree using his flair, his, his knack for doing things in a very flamboyant way. Why? Well, that's his nature. But it also attracts us, attracts us to his teachings so that we can be exposed to them and purified by them. Actually, if you think about the history of Mahabharata, Krishna even stirs up trouble to, to, to make it more interesting and to move the storyline along. There's a saying, them's fighting words. So Krishna kind of does that. He goes and like makes these things. Just think about it, how Duryodhan went to the palace of the Pandavas and he saw the, he saw what he thought was land or, or the hallway or the column, but it was actually water. And so he was walking and he fell into the water. And when he did that, all the palace ladies started laughing. Now, try to understand do you do? He's a very proud person, a kshatriya. He doesn't like to be insulted. He doesn't like to be made a fool of. But he was made a fool of, and the women in the palace were laughing. Now, normally, no, 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 don't, don't, don't laugh. No. But no, Krishna did nothing. He let them laugh and enjoy us, just to humiliate. Duryodhana. So what was the purpose of humiliating Duryodhana? To get him to fight in the war. So he, them fighting words. He, he pushed 
the situation along. He stirred up trouble so that the battle would take place. So Krishna is not one to shy away from public public uh, events, public involvement. And indeed, if you think about it, our lives as well are filled with probably to a better degree or a worse degree, are filled with political doings. We're also interested in these things. So why shouldn't Krishna be involved in things that are interesting and give us the bitter pill or the nectar pill in the midst of it. That's what Bhagavad Gita is. All this intrigue, palace intrigue is there. It's very interesting. It draws us in just to get us exposed to those 700 verses of Bhagavad Gita. So we're ready to take the lesson. You get exposed to the lesson. And so why was Bhagavad Gita spoken on a battlefield? Well, a big part of it was to make it interesting and relevant to the lives of the people. It was a war. It was a world war. And so what's affected in the world war? Our people all over the world are affected by, they're socially affected, economically affected. The happiness and distress of the people depends on the situation. And so all eyes and ears are focused on the war. So Krishna utilizes the same tactic, creating an all eyes, all ears situation so that he can give the pill of Bhagavad Gita to Krishna on the battlefield. And it's relevant to everyone's lives. So why not on the battlefield? Purposely, it should be on the battlefield. So there's also reasons why it should be on the battlefield and not other places, because other places are not affected. We think about Queen Kunti, whose, whose experiences are one of the things that also lead us, draw us in to hearing Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharata. Kunti, she prayed to Krishna that Jan Maheshwarya Shri Tishri Bir Edamana Maman was the last one. Naiva Harati Tama Kinshana Gotra. A Kinshana Gotra. Kunti Devi explains. I'll just read the translation of this verse in Srimad Bhagavatam. My Lord, your Lordship can be easily approached, but only by those who are materially exhausted. All the events leading up to the warfare, all the tragedies, people in a war, that's when this idea of a Kenshina Gotra can really be seen in human society. So those people, why is on spoken on the battlefield? Because people are, are materially exhausted at Kenshina Gotra. And Kunti Devi says, they can approach the Supreme Lord. Not those trying to improve themselves by respectable parentage, great opulence, high education, and bodily obedience. Endeavors in that regard prevent one from sincerely seeking the Supreme Lord. And so Kunti Devi gives us an idea of why it's spoken on the battlefield? Because you'll find people at Kenshin Nagotra materially exhausted. Whereas otherwise, everyone's having a good time trying to become aristocratic, trying to gain wealth, high education, bodily beauty. These things take up most people's time in life. And as a result, they don't invest time where it gives an impetus to be exposed to spiritual life. There's a saying that there are no atheists in foxholes. There's no atheists in foxholes. Have you heard this before? 
What does it mean? It means that foxhole is a, a hole you dig when you're in war. And you shoot, people are shooting at you. They want to kill you. And this is a little shelter you can have. And so people that are in that kind of dangerous situation of any kind of fight or war or serious threat, they turn to God. They turn to God. It's an impetus to turn to God. So there are no atheists in foxholes means that when you're in times of trouble, or if we related to this verse here of Kenshin Agotra, when you're completely exhausted trying to get all these material situations, you become exhausted, frantic, you have a nervous breakdown, whatever. But those things will prevent you from having the sincere feelings necessary to understand the Supreme Lord. And so, Quinty Dave is explaining that the troubles they went through were good because they gave an opportunity, the impetus to remember the Supreme Lord, Krishna, to take his teachings. And so that's another reason why we find Krishna is speaking Bhagavad Gita on the battlefield. But there's one last reason why Krishna spoke. Well, I don't call it the last, but there's another reason why Krishna spoke the battle on the battlefield to his devotee Arjuna. And that is found in the very next verse in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, text number 3. So eva yam maya tejya yoga prokta parantapa bhakto si me sakache ti rahasyam hiyati utamam. That very ancient science of the relationship with the Supreme is today told by me to you because you are my devotee as well as my friend and can therefore understand the transcendental mystery of this science. Krishna is willing to do or go any place for his devotees, to please his devotees. So this verse gives the main qualifications that you're his devotee and his friend. Those two things guarantee that the Lord will teach you Bhagavad Gita, will follow you anywhere to help you. Arjuna, as we know from all the, the 100,000 verses of Bhagavad Gita, was in a very difficult situation in life. He was faced with having to um, go to war against his grandsire, all of friends and families, members, and he, they, he had gone through so many tribulations with his brothers in their exile to the forest, to the trickery of Duryodhan and Dhritarashtra when living as small children in the palace. Their lives were hell. And so being on the battlefield was just a continuation of that. But Krishna was willing to accompany him on the battlefield to drive his chariot, actually. Actually, you, know, you may know, driving a chariot is a less, lesser rank, so to speak. Um, and Krishna, although he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead, agreed to take a lesser position as the charioteer of Arjuna. But he did it because Arjuna was a devotee and his friend, and Krishna must reciprocate with his devotees. And that includes going to the battlefield or wherever they may be situated in life. Krishna will accompany them. So this is applicable, applicable not only to Arjuna, he's not the only one. Krishna wants all of us to be his devotee and his friend. And when he does, he promises us by in Bhagavad Gita, Savadharma Parichaja, Mamekam Saranam Bhajaraham Tom Savapapadil, 
Moksha-shana-masa-jaha. He promises that if you surrender to me, that is, in other words, become my devotee, become my friend, then you don't have to worry about anything else. I'll take care of everything. Now this instruction is coming at the end, <coughs> at the end of Bhagavad Gita, after Krishna has already explained his opulences, his power, his abilities, his ability to save anyone from any situation, that's already been explained to Arjuna. And so he's telling all of that, I, may, I place it, <coughs> to, I, I bring that to my assistance to you. If you just surrender to me by becoming a devotee and becoming my friend. The whole mystery of the science or the relation with the Supreme Lord, the relation between the Supreme Lord and the individual soul, that whole mystery is explained to us. And even if it has to be done on a battlefield, Krishna will go with us. So we all have our own sort of battlefields in life, difficulties. So what are we to do? What shelter do we have? We were singing nice bhajan by Basu Ghosh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's associate, just last night. And he was explaining in his bhajan that what is the use of this world if you hadn't come, speaking to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? What is the use of this world? It would have just been trouble, and it just been anxiety. But by you coming, you've removed all of that. So that, that can be, Krishna is ready to remove all of it, even if it means there's a world war, he can remove it. But to speak of the smaller concerns we may have in our own individual lives. This is actually the real glory of Krishna and the real glory of why the battle, why the Bhagavad Gita was spoken on the battlefield. Just to show you the extent to which the Supreme Lord Krishna is our friend and is willing to save us. So with all of that being true, then what is the problem in us surrendering? Well, we can look back to those four things that Queen Kunti points out. Does anybody remember what the four things are? Can we name them? Let's name them in English. Aristocratic family. Aristocratic family. If you strive for that, you're going to be missing the opportunity. Higher education. That's two. Lots of money. Money, wealth, material opulence, and bodily beauty. Think how much of time and effort is spent just on those things. There's two drug stores on the corner down here. If you go in each one of them, there's a full section of beauty aids. And they're just right across the street from there. There's, there's plenty. People spend so much time and effort on those things. People get our age and they don't want to age, and so there's so much time and effort put in that, even after it's useless. <laughs> so these things divert us from our real mission in life. Um, and it, it shows us these two things, that Krishna, he has a flair for doing things, and um, He's very receptive to those who are his devotees and his friends. So we find Krishna and Arjuna on the battlefield. Krishna speaking Bhagavad Gita. And hopefully we can understand that a little bit better by discussing it as we've done here this evening. So are there any comments, questions about these subject matters? Brother Uchir.
Right, when Queen Kunti, she also says that um, my, not only does she want to not be relieved in those things, but she wants to be more, give more, because the purpose of, the sweetness of Krishna is that the more we turn to him, the sweeter he is. So it makes all the material difficulties disappear. Even though they may technically still be there, we don't feel them, and we feel the love of Krishna. And these things are simply aids in pushing us to push you. You can see how your relationship is cemented in that, in that situation. Mm. You know, that you're, you're taking so much, um, you know, so much you're begging Krishna. And that cements your relationship so that you're, you begin to open up a relationship with Krishna. Like our June, having that friend. Mm. Thank you. Any other realizations? Yeah, when he orchestrates everything, if you think about it, um, I was just hearing also just recently about Duryodhan getting instruction from Gandhari. Was it in Bhagavatam? Yes. Yeah. Getting instruction yes. from Gandhari, you know, to come undress. You know, and then Krishna was all of a sudden there, well, you know, how can you do that? Don't go like that, knowing perfectly well what he was doing. So, I mean, he, he has a flair to him. He you know, makes it interesting. Yes, well. No better? No, that's right. Because the unscrupulous commentators have sort of taken it as their own and giving their own interpretations which don't accept Krishna as the Supreme Lord, therefore it's necessary that it be spoken again and the truth as it is be given so that that is existent in society and not just these other um, false interpretations. Or, Um, 
Well, I think probably Bhagavad Gita was spoken at the time. Uh, I, I can't comment on it being an eternal scripture, but um, the teachings that were there, whether they're formally codified into Bhagavad Gita or not, had, were, were being corrupted and the, the supremacy of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, was being challenged. And so we can understand it in that way. You were going to say something about that? Power problem. He was saying there are many English, many versions of Gita, especially in English. Really? No, it says here, in the same way, at the present moment, there are also many editions of the Gita, especially in English. But, uh, but almost all of them are not according to the authorized specific succession. Specific succession goes back to Krishna. And so they're deviating from that. And so there's a need, Prabhupada says here also. As soon as the original purpose was scattered by the motives of the unscrupulous commentators, there arose a need to reestablish the disciplic succession. So he's speaking that himself. And in the verse, first verse in the fourth chapter of Mangala Jasha Ravadu, first verse of the chapter says, I instructed the imperishable science of yoga to the sun god, Vivaswan, and Vivaswan instructed it to Manu, the father of mankind. And Manu, in turn, instructed it to Isvaki. So they all predate Krishna, so to speak. And so the same teachings were there. Yeah, yeah it always, unfortunately, this is the material world, there will always be a necessity to go over, re make sure it's still on track, to correct the discrepancies. That's just the nature of of the Acharyas, that's what the Acharyas come and do. Anything else? Madam Asi? Well, I mean, everyone is different, but I mean, in general, I think we can say that there's an urgency to spiritual life that we should be taking advantage of. And that if we don't take advantage of it, then that's to our detriment. And so, of course, some people take more advantage of it than others, and that's good. And it may be on the basis of less suffering even so it's not that we're just masochists or something, we want people to suffer. You know, but suffering is there, and our response to it should be to try to end that suffering by redeveloping our relationship with Krishna. Is that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. Very good. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs>
That's the, the ingeniousness of the devotees, is that they create a way to keep the urgency fresh in our minds, but not be burdened with death. We don't think about that. Actually, I, I should mention that we celebrate death. Today, there was an over five-hour program for Mother Tunga Vidya, just glorifying everything that her life meant in service with her husband, Trikala Gyaprabhu. She passed away in Vrindavan a few days ago. And so it was a death, but everyone was full of life, telling the, recounting the life she led and, the, and the, the lives she touched and the heart she touched. And so that's what's actually going on, even though it may appear to be struggle in different ways. So um, death is not something that the devotee is afraid of or has to meditate on. Srimad Bhagavatam describes that Yuga Maharaj, when death approached, Death bowed down and Juva stepped on his head to get on the plane. So that's how we take it. When death comes, we simply step on the head and get on the airplane to go back to the spiritual world. Any other last points anyone has? Thank you very much. All glories